All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, February 10th Black History Nerd session. I am uh, LeGarrette King, your HNIC, your head nerd in charge, and I'm so happy to have everybody here uh, for Examining Black Studies with Dr. Frederick Douglass Dixon. Um, just a few uh, few comments before we uh, get to our featured nerd um, today. Um, again, for people who are new, because each time we have a different kind of speaker, we have new people coming here as well as our um, our regulars. Um, Happy Black History Month uh, from the Center for K-12 Black History and Racial Literacy Education. Here you'll see our beautiful staff and, and um, our team members here with Dr. Brittany Jones, Dr. Christina King as assistant directors. And of course, you all know our graduate fellows. They are becoming uh, major celebrities around the Black history space with uh, Donovan Greg Daphne um, here. So I'm so delighted to have everybody here. Of course, if you do not know what the center is, we are a, a research and professional development um, center that seeks to improve uh, Black history education in our classrooms. We do that through our research, uh, our professional development, our networking, and our advocacy. Our signature program um, that you all should be uh, saving the date for is our Teaching Black History Conference, where we convene hundreds of teachers from around the world to uh, talk about the best if, and best and effective practices around Black history education. I know uh, Dr. Dixon, he um, he um, he presented in the 2022 Teaching Black History Conference and everybody raved about his session and wanted to be longer. Uh, so this, this year's theme is Black to the Future, Afrofuturism as Black History. Um, if we can put the uh, registration link in, I'm not at the registration link, the proposal link in the uh, chat or um, our website in the chat so people can look forward um, to looking at the things that we do. If you are interested in submitting a proposal for this year's Teaching Black History Conference, um, if you have any ideas on Afrofuturism, please. If you do not have any ideas on Afrofuturism, but any type of topic around Black history education, please submit because this is a Black history education conference and we need all the knowledge about all forms of Black history, even if it doesn't connect to the theme. So please do that. Those are due March 2nd, but please don't wait um, to the last minute. Just go ahead, 300 to 500 words and submit. We'll have the link in the chat. Again, uh, this is uh, Black History Month 2024. Um, the national theme this year is African-American and the arts. And you all can read um, about African-American arts through the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History. We'll have that link in the chat as well. For those who do not know, each year, the center, we curate uh, several articles for the special edition of Education Week during Black History Month. Um, oh, man, I forget, f f forgot to put Donovan's new um, uh, video blog um, in there. If, if we can put Donovan's uh, video blog in the um, chat. We have four excellent um, uh, featured articles by Dr. Christine Wushner. Dr. Brittany Jones is our assistant director, uh, Dr. Ashley Den um, Dennis, as well as Abigail Henry um, on various different um, understandings around Black History and Black History Month. We also have our resource list uh, curated by our uh, center staff that you all can um, enjoy. Uh, and then also um, I highlight three outstanding um, Black History educators um, around the country, Dr. Um, Laura Smothers from the Joy Village in Athens, Georgia, which um, I think a lot of people who would like to start independent Black schools, you may want to look at her as example. Right now, uh, the school closed because of funding, right? So I would love to help get that um, funding up to help her um, open the school. I'm telling you, it, she does a wonderful job with um, you know Black youth in the Athens area. Uh, Schoolyard Rap, um, Bryant B, wonderful Black history educator, our edutainer, right? Uh, if you have his album, he's Grammy um, nominated, as well as he won a few Grammys for his work around Black history songs, um, Latino history songs, et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, in class with Greg Carr and Karen Hunter, uh, the people's professor, they do this every Saturday. So when we don't have Black history nerds or whatever the case would be, I, I encourage you to go follow or 
look at old um, videos around Black history on their YouTube channel. And then also like I, I said, Donovan had um, did a video blog on the frequently asked questions around Black history. Uh, so please check that out. We'll have that in the comments here. All right, um, we just finished um, our first educators book club with um, Push Out, uh, which was facilitate, um, facilitated by uh, Daphne Bibbs. Um, today, we start our second book club of the um, of 2024. Uh, Donovan, you want to speak a little bit about your book club, which starts today at 1230? Yeah, good morning, y'all. Uh, so today at 12.30 and for the next five weeks, we will be doing a book club on Beyond February, Teaching Black History, Any Day, Every Day, and All Year Long, written by me. Um, so come and join us, even if you don't have the book or didn't get a chance to read it. It'll be great conversation, and it looks like a really good community of people. Great. Yeah. And uh, please try to get your book. I know it's going to take a little longer because it's been sold out everywhere. I'm talking about Barnes and Noble, Amazon, all these particular places because y'all just need to get the book. I know everybody on this call has the book, right? If you do not go ahead and um, get the book, this is the book that uh, all elementary educators have been asking for for so long. Um, um, so of course, um, you know, the book's a wonderful book and the book club will be excellent. So we will see you around 1230 today um, uh, for the Educators of Book Club today. Um, as you are planning Black History Month events, uh, remember February 14th is Frederick, Frederick Douglass Day. Um, if, if um, you know, Greg or Daphne can, can look up a few, um, a few activities around Frederick Douglass Day that, um, you know, people are doing, um, then please put that in the chat. Uh, you know, of course, um, you all can all, uh, particularly the classrooms, can, you know, read his autobiography, certain speeches that, you know, he's had. Um, There's several different children's books. If we can put those children's books in the chat, you know, about Frederick Douglass, uh, who was probably one of the most prominent uh, Black historic, um, Black men in the 19th century. Um, Frederick Douglass Day started a few years after his passing in 1895 by, um, Mary Church Terrell, who was an excellent Black, his, uh, black history educator, Black educator of herself um, in D.C., um, and also Frederick Douglass Day was one of the reasons why Black History Month is in uh, February, right, uh, because a lot of Black communities were already celebrating uh, Frederick Douglass Day, and Carter G. Woodson thought it would be a seamless transition to include Negro History Week, the week of Frederick Douglass Day, since Black people were already starting it. So um, we'll put a few uh, resources in the chat for you all uh, to kind of explore. Um, and um, hopefully you all will do something on February 14th. While the um, while some of you are going to have Valentine's stuff, you all can switch to Frederick Douglass Day um, in the afternoon then. Shameless plug again, all right, for those who need their fix of Girl Scout cookies. Of course, my daughter is selling Girl Scout cookies. Um, if 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 you need a plug, we have the plug, right? If you don't support my baby, I'm just going to assume that you don't like Black girls so you don't want to support um, uh, Black girl entrepreneurship. I don't know. I'm just going to so assume that, right? All right, but anyway, but if you really want to... Um, have some Girl Scout cookies. We'll put the link in the chats. All right, enough of me. All right, our guest nerd today is Dr. Frederick Douglass Dixon. Uh, he is an assistant professor, and I want to say the director of African American and Black Studies at Radford University. I believe he was um, the first Black Studies director at the University of Wyoming a few years ago, uh, but now he has taken his talent to the East Coast here. Um, and I'm very excited to learn with him and from him um, today. So let's welcome Dr. Douglas, uh, Frederick Douglas Dixon. All right, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I was just introduced to the staff today and had a very brief time to discuss a few things with them and I, I wanna pass them on to you. Yes, my name is Frederick Douglas, so as I guess Dr. King just said, uh, at this point, we, we are ready because absolutely no time and it's better. So just a few things as to understand Frederick Douglass. 
to say that Frederick Douglass was a person that was self-taught in many ways is true. But to understand Frederick Douglass is to understand what Thoreau said slaves could not do. He humanizes through the lens of the white gaze who literally gives him his thoughts as far as how he would be presented to the world. But one thing, is anybody here? Please put it in the chat. Know his original name? Let's start right there. This is Frederick Douglass Day and Frederick Douglass Week, and you got one version of Frederick Douglass with you. But Dixon, Dixon in itself, you all, let's, let's talk about that. That's a Scottish name. So still to this day, no matter what my father as a great historian tried to do, I'm still tagged with this name that says slavery. It says Jim Crow. And it says the American flag. You know what it says? It's as American as hot dogs, apple pie, and Chevrolet. That's what that name says. So to understand Frederick Douglass, did anybody get it? Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Great answer. Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. But to understand that is to understand his life as a slave. To understand that is to understand that his mother, right around 14 years old, gave birth to him because of this rape that took place with the slave master. So as we form through Frederick Douglass, one of his most important or seminal speeches is what to the slave is the 4th of July, correct? We all know that term, right? July 5th, 1852, Rochester, New York, not far from where you are on the planet. And Frederick Douglass gives this rendering space where he talks about, he understands and gives value to the founding fathers and what they wanted as freedom. And then he gives this critique about the hypocrisy of them using that same kind of thought to create a, a country with stolen land and free labor. So to understand Frederick Douglass is to understand this whole idea of hypocrisy. He is what we begin to understand as what a black man really is. So when I think about that particular speech, how do we make that? And these are for the teachers. How do we make that relevant for our students? How do we make it relevant for our students? What to the slave is the 4th of July? Well, that in itself is a very stern and very important question. But after we understand Frederick Douglass's words, and his words are more than apropos, when he says, he said, the feeling of the nation must be challenged. The conscience of the nation must be riled. Propriety of the nation must be startled. And its crimes against God and man must be denounced. Go where you will, search where you may, and you will agree with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. So he gives a stern rebuke. But how do we make that relevant to a seventh grader today? Frederick Douglass was indeed the most photographed man of the 19th century. 20th century Muhammad Ali, 21st century Barack Obama. So for us to understand these kind of things and make it relevant, a couple of years ago in 2021, I held a summer symposium. And, and, and let me be clear here, most folks don't like to do any work during the summer, particularly not folks in higher ed. You can't get them to do anything. They're on vacation. So we asked them to be a part of it, but we had to change this idea of what to the slave is the 4th of July so it could come alive, so it could have a new kind of thought. So for all of my K through 12 educators, we wanna talk about some of those things today, but I wanna start like this. We went from what to the slave is the 4th of July to what to the slave's children is the 4th of July. One word allowed for us to have a way that we could look at it that would include our youngest generation. So without any further ado, I'm ready to move on. All right, so here we go. My exacting statement comes from Dr. Lerone Bennett. And Dr. Bennett himself, a longtime writer for Jet Magazine, a longtime writer for Johnson Publications, and he puts it this way. He says, in a system of oppression, an educator is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. He doesn't leave too much room for you to ride the fence. So when I think about Dr. Lerone Bennett, he spent a lot of time in Chicago. I'm from Chicago, so in being a second-generation person, I didn't know him personally, but I knew who, exactly who he was. And he wrote brilliantly, and we'll hear from him a little bit later. But to understand this, let us pay attention now to the picture, caption. And it says, in a system of oppression, an educator is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. 
Well, to look at this caption, to understand this caption, the way this picture and how provocative it is, it seems as if they're highly engaged. But let me explain this. When we talk about cultural connections, when we talk about this idea of us bringing our biases to the table. I was at the University of Illinois for about four years in Champaign and worked in the education part, particularly that vein that created the K through 12 certificate. And what they graduated there was close to 90% of white women who were from Northern affluent suburbs that would eventually go into the Chicago public schools. So thinking of it that way, and to understand they were incentivized because they would be paid more money after this program is to understand how education feels about certain populations, particularly the youngest populations that we know, and particularly Black students. It looks as if they're engaged. My question is, what kind of biases is she bringing to the table? I remember teaching some of those courses. And in teaching some of those courses, the titles were very challenging, but not necessarily the content. So there were ways that we had certain conversations over other conversations. So I wanted to begin with an exacting statement. So my theoretical perspective comes from the Negro problem or the Negro question. If you're not familiar with this set of understandings, then I take you to the Mohawk Conference of 1890. This is a conference where the North and the South gathered together to quash the vestiges of the civil rights move, the civil war and move into the 20th century. So what came of this was this question that came. And if you haven't heard the Negro problem or the Negro question, I suggest that you write this down. And it reads, what should be done with the presence of the troublesome Negro for maximum exploitation? Again, Rutherford B. Hayes presided over this space. A young man named Smiley was the curator of this space. And he said, we have to make them law-abiding citizens. He also says we have to make them working citizens. So this idea of how the United States would move into the 20th century theoretically is being played out here. And then there's a global thought that's being played out over many spaces in Africa with the conference in 188, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. So this is a united movement across the globe to say, how would we deal with Blacks, particularly in America, this newly freed slave? And how did they respond? Well, I'm sure all of you know by 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson becomes law of the land. So what was happening at the turn of the century? They were explaining to you the Negro problem, the Negro question, and the answer to it. We will live separate but equal. Now, the equal part in itself is very relative, but separate was the law. All right, so we want to get into Dr. Nathan Hare today. And I encourage you to put all your questions in the chat. I'll do my best to get to them and create some conversation before we go. Anybody familiar with Dr. Nathan Hare? What a great man. Dr. Nathan Hare is still amongst us. And of March 7th, he'll be 91 years old. But Dr. Nathan Hare is known for the very first Black Studies Center, Black Studies program at San Francisco State in 1969. For many of you all who are familiar with that, this is a very turbulent time. This is when students are calling for Black studies. This is what students are demanding Black studies. And how does the ivory tower respond? Well, they create a phenomenon. Well, we begin to see these places sprouting up all across the country. But to know Dr. Hare, some of the lesser known things is he represents this understanding of civil rights to black power. He epitomizes that. And for all of you all who understand, look at the Black Power Conference in Gary, and he was tasked with the youth program. So he gives a very distinctive lens on how black studies by that time would tie into the youth. Very important that you understand that. Mentored Stokely Carmichael while he was a graduate student at Howard University. I think that's very interesting too, to think about Stokely Carmichael who eventually becomes Kwame Ture and all that he did in 1964 and Freedom Summer and those ways that he connected to voting rights, he was still in some ways a registered graduate student. So it's very interesting to think about that. And you can find Dr. Hare's readings all across these thoughts about Black studies. And one of them is called The Struggle for Black Studies. I think you should look at that. But Dr. Hare in himself, 
known as a prize fighter and fought under the name of Nat Turner. Why? Because some of those stringent and very draconian non or de facto rules at Howard University for their faculty became problematic for him. So if we can understand Dr. Nathan Hare, then we understand he was fired in 1966 as a sociologist from Howard University. This is the kind of man that we're talking about. Everybody take a, a real quick review and read this. This is Dr. Nathan Hare speaking about Black Studies one year after its formation and its entree into the ivory tower. This is what he writes. very stern critique. But if we look now backwards with a clear vision, he was absolutely correct from its inception. He gives a critique of it the year after it becomes formalized. And what does he say? Corrupted and co-opted. So study of blacks or what we call Negro studies. Dr. Hare says is restricted to recounting historical trivials and fettering out black contributions. So in many ways, he ties this to historical revisionism. So he gives it a critique. And what does he say black studies should do? It should burn down a decadent world of corruption. That was his thought. So thinking about it that way is very revolutionary, but instantly co-opted. And what was he saying was a decadent world? Many of us believe that when we want clarity, or we look to a way to legitimize our thoughts and we use rhetorical devices or terms, then we need to be clear on those terms. We need to know the definition. What kind of definition was Dr. Nathan Hare looking to interrupt and intervene? Well, everybody stop right here. These are definitions that come right around the time of the rise of the Montgomery bus boycott. So this is right around 1954, 1955 in the Webster's Dictionary. I have everybody, and I'm gonna go over these, but I have everybody, your job right now, if you can go with me, is to select the one that is the most interesting to you and we're gonna revisit it. But how about these definitions for white? Free from blemish, without sin. Morally or spiritually pure, spotless, innocent. Free from evil content, intent harmless and notions of racial superiority. The one that knocks off to me, the one that rises up to me is the last one, notions of racial superiority. More than just notions, but given to us as if to say, it is not exactly that way. Or many folks would say microaggressions are not micro. So everybody please write one down, one that we can discuss by the time we get to the end of this presentation. Now, what can we compare it with? Opposite of white, covered in darkness, soil, dirty, evil, wicked, harmful, disgraceful. And look at the last one, black villain. So let's think about some of those ways that we've learned this idea of blackness and the way that this dictionary has helped and the rhetorical devices that have pushed this further. So most times when you think about a, a villain, he wears black and a black cat in many ways is bad luck. And you wear black to a funeral and white to a wedding to understand that, you know, you have a black curse versus a little white lie. These are the things that concretize what Dr. Hare was intervening and how he wanted this to be so readily available for anyone who wanted to make sure that they could become more erudite, but especially for black students. So thinking about the naming, of Black Studies or the renaming of Black Studies as a discipline, all of these spaces, all of these terms have had, if you will, their chance of being spoken to as the new term. Particularly Africology, Africana Studies, those are more recent. Afro-American Studies. So if we look at what Dr. Nathan Hare says in the Black Journal in 71, he said he had been thinking about making us call ourselves Africans in 1962. And we know even before that, Marcus Garvey, you and I's you NIA's movement, Noble Jew Ali bringing us this thought of Islam to America. 
These are multiple veins of ways that we need to be able to distinguish ourselves as a united group. So thinking about what Dr. Harris is saying, I want to take a step back. Now we're beginning to see his words and his contextual analysis lead us to understanding his value during this particular time, during 1969. So Dr. Hare goes on to say, by 1972, he continued to critique. So if we're clear, 2024 represents Black studies on its 55th anniversary. So at this point, if Dr. Hare has trained us well enough, if we can take from it and take the best and leave the rest, then we need to give a critique of Black studies, not only at 50, but at 55. So he says there can be no equality in education in a racist society. And look at the very last one. He said it's for radical black liberation. Just imagine those terms. Now, when we're in the era of book banning, we're in the era of voter suppression, radical black liberation. Dr. Hare in himself lays these things out for us to continue to deal with in a way that's empirical, but also is fluid so that it can make sense to us today. And we'll get to that just in a little bit. But what does Dr. Hare mean when he says the historical inquiries, where he talks about African society as the motherland of culture? And Dr. Henry Clark said, you know, those systems that govern the universe now were created by black men, I'm paraphrasing here, before a white European man lived in a house or lived in a house or wore a shoe. So these greats have given us these candid critiques of Eurocentric education. When we think about the sociological inquiry, we talk about the nuclear family as the component, the fundamental component of society. Well, let's think about what the transatlantic slave trade did to the black nuclear family. And we still suffer greatly from those messages right now. How about the psychological individual and collective psychology and the socialization and how we socialize? And for the group that's gonna put something in the chat, two things. One is um, Dr. Bobby E. Wright's Menticide, M-E-N-T-A-C-I-D-E. I'd like for folks to be able to get that. And Dr. Bobby E. Wright's psychopathic racial personality. This is a critique of over the years what this European and Western domination has done to the black psyche. I think it'll be very important for those who are able to craft certain lesson plans to be able to have these thoughts readily at hand. And you, you take the best and leave the rest. And then the political inquiry, ties to political disenfranchisement. Think about what's going to happen and the importance of what will become this 2024 presidential election. This is going to change the world. Over the last, let's say using Barack Obama as the seminal event, we have seen these pushbacks that remind us of years that have gone by, in some ways could be considered black codes revisited. So let's be very clear here. In the economic inquiry, when we think about what would be owed for the price of slavery or reparations, and this idea of King Cotton and how that becomes part of the contemporary or fluidity of the lexicon, then we need those Black economists and those who are skilled enough to give us these understandings in a way that you can, particularly those of you all who are teaching K through 12, can inject them into your lesson plans without having the pushback of it being so very radical, which is taking over our society. So the word interdisciplinary and the interdisciplinary approach in itself, I'm gonna go through these and continue to look at these through the lens of Dr. Hare. So we think about this Eurocentric domination and how it parcels out this European understanding as this space where we find the origin of science, the origin of medicine. Well, on further review, we know very well, Jake Carruthers, Dr. Jacob A. Carruthers says it very well that we know that Plato spent at least 13 years at the feet of Egyptian professors. And what comes out of Jake's um, critique is he was more tied to or enamored with the soft sciences than he was the hard science, especially political science and philosophy. 
Now that's only one part of that African education. So the blackenization or the Santa Clausization of European disciplines that become where we find ourselves in positions as victims to these lesson plans, to these inabilities to be able to forward esoteric information and then look at what happened with black studies on its inception at Yale. According to many folks, to secure a black PhD, you had to take the majority of your courses in a European discipline. And at Yale, it was 75%. And at Harvard during this time, at least half of your required courses had to came, come from a European discipline, a traditional European discipline. And your transcript would read as such. So this is the response of the ruling regime to this phenomenon of Black studies, or what some would call white massive resistance to Black studies. So multiculturalism, to understand who controls higher ed, we have to understand the term and the functionality of multicultural and multiculturalism. And we all know that's the thought of more than one culture having a say or being prominent in the crafting of certain knowledges. But multiculturalism in African-American studies is so problematic because what it leads to, it leads to the ability of some to have never ever taught a course or taken a course in African-American studies to not only teach the subject, but become leaders and those who have authority in the purse straps, in the content connection, in the classroom instruction. So multiculturalism, as Dr. Hare would say, needs to be burned down as part of this decadent world. So what eventually becomes of Black studies that we see now? And we know it's always very fragile. We know it's always uncertain. Just to think about Radford University, a public institution in Southwest Virginia, just opening its initial African-American studies program in 2023. Never forget, Virginia is the third state to ratify slavery in 1660. But as we read what Dr. Allen says here, wholesale comebacks. Now this is in 1974. How does it apply to today? Academic critics. And when we think about that, the phenomenon of black studies, the phenomenon of black studies was as strong, if not stronger as the phenomenon of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And as we see now, it has worn itself out. The time stamp is up and we're beginning to see how many folks are being removed and how the response to diversity, equity, and inclusion is now being not only challenged, but removed. But think about it in that way. The blackness in black studies, what Dr. Nathan Harris says for liberation's sake, and to think about what it can produce, how do we think about black studies and how does it align itself with AI without being a victim of AI? I think these are things that we have conversations with our youngest populations with because it brings about a new reality. Now for all of you all, let's think about some content connection. These are just suggestions. We see the Falcon here, the Kemet God of kingship, and then we see what we call the seal of the United States. Anybody see anything that's very similar here? Please put it in the chat. Anybody see this being something that's borrowed heavily from Kemet? Well, thinking about Kemet then, we can critique Egyptologists, we should critique the idea of the word Egypt. But when we think about Kemet, Kemet means land of the burned skin and black skin people. So this is one way that you can introduce a primary source to your students and have this kind of conversation. So thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, America's longest social movement, but let's get to the dates. So-called dates, everybody, 1619 to 1865, not correct. We know by 1555, John Hawkins was trading slaves right in this area, Virginia, North Carolina. So what does that leave us if we have this disparity between 1619 and 1555, 64 years of slavery unrecorded? This is the way that you have and question and challenge the timeline of African of what we know now as the transatlantic slave trade with your students empirically. And then for us to have 
extreme connections to the quantifiable part. This part of it itself said it was 64 years of a scientific process that brought Africans here and made them slaves and continued on perpetually for hundreds of years. So one way we look at the great Thomas Jefferson, I am currently now in the state of Virginia. We know him as the author of the Declaration of Independence. And in the word author, we see authority. So when he talks about slavery, can you all quickly read that? And we're going to move right along. This is Jefferson's way of explaining away what he thought was important about slavery. He said, we can have the wolf by the ears. Imagine how close you have to be to have the wolf by the ears. And we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other. Absolutely, at this point, we can understand what Thomas Jefferson chose to do and the route he chose to take. Absolutely, self-preservation. And more than anything, Thomas Jefferson in his cell looks to the avarice, greed of, of capitalism as a way that he forwarded his thought, especially if you have known the notes on the state of Virginia. Now, this was a, a very important piece. And using this, and it was the first query, there were over 17 queries. The first query was in 1781, written in French when he was the ambassador to France. Does anybody know who he has with him there? He has his daughter and he also has a 14 year old slave named Sally Hemming. So to understand what he says, his words are more than apropos. He says, the first difference between whites and black is color. And he goes on to say, and is this difference of no importance or does it represent greater or less beauty? And so when we think about it, he's putting many ways a moral value on a physical feature. So to think about a moral value on a physical feature, a good example is what is good hair? A moral value on a physical feature. Well, what is good hair? And for all our educators, this may be a good way to take some snippets out of Chris Rock's piece and have that as a point of conversation in a classroom setting. But thinking about what he says about Blacks, how about the first one? We're equal. And that's the only time that he uses that term, that we're equal to whites in memory. And he goes on to go back to his point. In reason, inferior, much inferior. So when he says that we participate more of sensation, that means than reflection, more from the body's thoughts and not from the intellectual portions of the brain. And everybody look at the very last one. Notes on the state of Virginia. As we read this, he said, I advance this as suspicion only, period. He preludes, I have no evidence. This is just something that I say is very suspicious to me. And I want those to understand that I laid it out in this way. He said, the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstance, very important. Originally, when we think about the origin, we think about the creator. So he said, whether by God or by slavery, inferior in, endow in endowments of body and mind. Let's think about the great emancipator. Many folks have a thought about Abraham Lincoln and some of the things that he did, being a radical Whig, understanding that he eventually becomes a president that is assassinated. But this idea of how he tied himself to the Civil War and the transatlantic slave trade. Now, we talked about Lerone Bennett earlier when he said an educator is either an oppressor or a revolutionary. You should get his book. I'm sorry, you all. I'm working the folks in the chat. The name of the book is Forced to Glory. If you could find a link for that, Forced to Glory. And from this, this is what Lerone Bennett says. He said, you know, 
They can believe in the inferiority of blacks. He supported segregation. He told jockey jokes, used the N-word. That's not a big deal because what normally happens is that folks explain that away with saying he was a person of his time. He was a man of his time. There are many men and women who are still of this mindset right now. And many folks think about Lincoln in a way that says he freed the slaves without understanding or injecting into it that when he, on January 1st, 1863, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he was still very much interested up until that time. And I'm sure therefore afterwards in the deportation and he had these spaces in Liberia that were cut out to make sure that they could get rid of free blacks because he said the problem is that they the slaves get to see the free blacks and that's problematic so the great emancipator or was he just a great politician if you've never heard of stephen the douglas lincoln lincoln douglas debates it's well worth your time to understand his words as we know them so when we think about lincoln's legacy Think about it this way. What does he say? Never been in favor of making them voters or juries, qualifying them to hold office, intermarry. And he said, there's a physical difference here that will forbid the two races living together in terms of equality. Now, another thing for our K through 12 educators, this is a way that we begin to critique Lincoln speaking in 1858 and his assassination in 1865, we have to inject his trajectory. How does he grow into this space? So when we think about this, this is a public forum, 1858, and he loses this race. But eventually, to have our students understand that people do transfer and transform, this is one way to look at how to have that conversation about Lincoln, which will indeed enhance the traditional thoughts. How about Dr. King? How do we look at Dr. King? They've narrowed Dr. King down to four letters, four words. I have a dream. Now, everybody knows the I have a dream part, and most of us know this other part is very critical. And he gives us his thought on why we came here. But just to understand how he begins the I have a dream or March on Washington speech. He says, for the most part, we're back here 100 years later after Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, still asking for jobs and justice. To understand Dr. King, it's a couple ways that you can teach it, but one of those ways is teaching it in a non-traditional sense. I say the first thing that you would like to teach about Dr. King, for many of you all who have not read this or are very familiar with his facing the challenge of a new age speech in 1957. My suggestions would be as you look to these guidelines on the left, that would be like reading Dr. King's title and how the civil rights movement and how it needs to be destructed and deconstructed, how it begins. So looking at it as, Deconstructing the title, Dr. King lays out nonviolence and the ways that he gives this praise to those Southerners who did not leave the South during the first and second waves of migration and how they changed the world with the Montgomery bus boycott and beyond. How about the second one? Say, read the introduction. Well, if you read the introduction and then you look at Number three, read the conclusion. Then from the facing the challenge of a new age speech, go right to where do we go from here, chaos of community, chapter two. That's his last book that was written in 1967. And by 1963, they have a different opinion of Dr. King. They have different content of Dr. King if we use a non-traditional approach. So as Dr. King, so as Dr. King becomes part of this, Dr. Harris says it's always a crucial time in Black studies. And in 1969, in the first year, he gives his thought. Most Black studies programs do not reflect critical intentions of Black studies, and therefore our reverse of Negro studies. So this is my call to action and wanting everybody here who's involved in education to know that I am 
extremely interested in partnering and becoming part of what's needed as a bridge. And it doesn't have to be formal, but I would love to see how I could connect what I'm teaching in my classrooms with what you're teaching in your classrooms to build that bridge. I think about Dr. Hare, and I think about this particular piece that is going on here right now. And to understand that what this center is doing, providing this space is extremely taken in direct and specific ways from what Dr. Hare asked for us to do. So I want to make sure that I avail myself to anyone here who is in the season of working with higher ed. One thing I find by the time students get to higher education and they take an introduction to African-American studies class, one of the things becomes popular is that they have for the most part, not had enough experience or exposure to some of the fundamental things that we want to interrupt that. We want to make sure that we intervene on that. For anyone's here, I would love to think about that in a way that we could connect. And some of those things that we do, we are already doing them at the same time. But to make sure that there are not necessarily seamless transitions, but this understanding of the importance of being connected in these same spaces. So I wanna thank all of you all, each one of you here who has spent your time and introduced to some and reintroduced to others the importance of Dr. Nathan Hare, particularly at 55 years old. Thank you all for your time and I'll do my best to answer all the questions. Thanks, Doc. Right now. All right, let's give Dr. Douglas a big round of applause. Um, here, let's see everybody here for his time this morning. All right, so we'll open up for any questions um, and then we'll we'll scan the uh, comment section for those who put questions um, there as well. All right, so you can uh, unmute un yourself and um, ask any questions that you ain't wanna want to. I wanna thank you first off for making it plain and simple for even non-educators to understand what you were saying. I'm a retired teacher long out of the field, but every time I get a nugget of knowledge, I pass it on to someone else. And I need sometimes simpler ways to pass it on so they can open their mind to go further. So I thank you for your talk this morning because it was simple enough for someone to understand who's long out of the field who has not had the training you have. I will mute myself. Well, I think your training is so very important and, and you are that person and you represent that generation and we need to be connected because the techniques and strategies that are going to be used that are being applied now, they're not necessarily new strategies and techniques, but they're so fluid, right? They can stand the test of time and to not have you at the table with your thoughts and not to have us have access to you for training is indeed incomplete. And that's intellectually incompetent. So I thank you, but I, I'm very clear here, you all, that I was trained by a group, but more none more so than my father. So I was trained to do everything that I have done here today and I didn't do a lot for it. So I owe a lot for it. So that's why I'm here not to do the conscious pilot and cleanse my hands, but to be involved. Any other questions from the gallery? Go ahead, Abigail. Go ahead. Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Douglas. That was a really wonderful presentation. I got a lot out of it. Thank you um, so much. I am piloting the AP African-American Studies course. Oh and God. I'm wondering, what is your opinion on it being called AP African-American Studies versus AP African-American History? And have you looked at the curriculum at all? Like, Just what are your general thoughts on My that? My general thoughts, I've paid some attention to it, but I think African-American Studies and African-American History is separated. Like they have different veins of understanding, right? There's the history of it. And then there's African American studies, which is renamed from black studies and black studies itself was a way to 
if you will, democratize and ameliorate what we find in history. And if we put African-American in front of it, then we know that there are holes, there are gaps, there are discrepancies. So the title of it all, I'm sorry to say, doesn't bother me as much as what the content would be or how you would go about creating that. Because I do believe in some ways we still fall under, particularly now, we fall under these these ways and having these veins of understanding or these veneers that sometimes when we use certain titles, it allows for us a bit more flexibility for the content. And if that's what's being traded off, then I surely believe that the title in itself is far less important than the content. So I do believe that they're two separated issues. How do you think about going about merging those? And tell me one of the things that you found to be not just interesting, but you continue to see it emerge or bubble up as far as an impediment. Yeah, that's that's a good good thought. I'm, I mean, for me, it's just the course is very dense and I don't have the amount of time ever to dive deep into some of the content of the lessons. But I hear what you're saying too about it's about it's the like content, not the title. Course. And if you take that approach, you know, you do your best, but you have to keep moving. And, and the thing is, we need so much. And then another thing is that, you know, we all come to the table and we'll spend a little bit more time on this because we think this is more important than someone would who thinks something else is a little more important. And that's the push and pull. And that's the contention. And the more and more that contention becomes where you're sharing that with other folks, they have the same kind of contention. Then those things become a bit more fleshed out because you're not alone in that thought because it becomes a group. So again, uh, please let me know what I can do. I think what you are saying is the content is more important than the title. And in the content, we need to get more truth in, whether we get more facts in, we need to make it based on truth and forget the titles and forget what you have been taught because mostly what we have been taught was not true. So it's more important to get the truth in, whether you get all of the facts in. I will mute. I thank you. I agree with you. I think there's a way that I look at it too, but don't get me wrong. I'm not above this training that has taken place over the years and how it affects me now. But one of the things is, you know, I, I in many ways think about the title as being symbolic. And now how can I use that to get to a space where I think that's more important in the content? And I think that anytime we all have these conversations, we should be willing to put it on the table in a way that, you know, for most of us, we don't see things the same. We are absolutely not a monolith. That's why we have these groups, these silos, and they don't necessarily have connection. We have any questions in the comments? I have one here. How can I incorporate this into how I prepare future teachers to teach? I think the content connection is always big. I think it's how you house it around content connection and how you can be clear, but you have to be very uh, skilled in such a way to discuss certain things. Well, thinking about the examples of Abraham Lincoln. Well, there's ways that you use Abraham Lincoln's own words, which just does not dissolve the pushback necessarily that you'll get from using certain content, but they're asking you to use content in that way you can. So if you center it around content connection, and then you're very savvy about what content that you like to use and for what purpose, and whoever said that I have a couple PowerPoints that I can send them. Can you please put my um, email in the chat? It's FD. D I X O N. So it's F D Dixon. There's that name again, that Scottish name, F D Dixon at radford.edu. Please feel free to reach out to me because um, I have a piece that asks if President Lincoln was anti slavery or was he an abolitionist. So I use those terms to further clarify. And then I think it's in many ways your crowd. 
your class? How do they respond to what, how you would be able to build up to that conversation? What would you be able to use? Somebody, somebody else right there? Jason, I didn't see that. Was there a comment by Jason? Um, just, yeah, okay. the, the sad part is, you know, state curriculums, yes. whether purposely or not, they, they void it out. And it is the duty of our, us as history teachers to find those voids and those blind spots and incorporate mm -hmm. in them. And I, I really appreciate you bringing those primary documents because they can, it, it's not a separate history. It's part of the history and it, it needs to be shown so they can see the whole picture and i really appreciate you I, I can't wait to dig more on this on my own so i can share with my clinical residents well, so thank Jackson, you as you mentioned earlier you make a very important point that these standards have a way of washing out certain aspects but if you think about that that has to be expected as i'm sure you do expect it but is this is part of the ruling regime, right? It's part of the playbook that they will use. So now the onus still goes back on the instructor. How savvy can they be to move this forward? I think about it all the time. Like, what do I put on the PowerPoint and what do I say and how then how do I say it? So it's about critical self-reflection. It's about knowing all the local politics, particularly in one school versus another school that you may have had different experiences. But it's well worth it because when you flesh it out a certain way and then you're always critically self-reflective about it, it gives about new kind of ways that we should be using as parameters. All right, we have time for one more um, question if someone um, has one. I'm Dr. Um, Douglas, excellent presentation. So do we just email you and request the two Absolutely. PowerPoints, please? Absolutely. Um, just keep up with me. Um, I do as much as I can with the email, so I will respond. I absolutely will. But I really think it's a big difference between being a PhD and being a doctor. When I think about that, I, I want to close with that too, Dr. K. I, I'm so taken by what I see sometimes as this gap between K through 12 and higher ed and this arrogance, ego, and vanity that's tied to higher ed this idea of, of being a doctor. Well, earning a PhD in many ways shows that you could endure and you could secure as much, if you will, Western education that will give you the credentialing at its highest capacity. But I think about how the word doctor implies one can heal, implies that you have now secured so much or enough information and that you can now combat the evolutionary problems and the trajectories that come from those problems in a way that can heal the society. So what I think about it, I think about we have brilliant Black sociologists like Dr. Nathan Harry gave his life, continues to give his life. And because of the Eurocentric view that we begin to call him a doctor and others a doctor, and then we look at the plight and the condition of the black society. It doesn't add up. So when I think about those folks who are brilliant black sociologists, psychologists, like I gave you connections to Dr. Bobby E. Wright. And then I look at the plight and the condition of the black psyche. So they, is, they produce answers that will never be answered for capacity of equality and explanations that can never be explained other than inequality. So when I think about that, I think it's very hypocritical when folks say that they are a doctor when they've only earned a PhD. Right now. Dr. King. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, I have a thank you and I also have a quick comment. First of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Douglas, for your presentation. And my comment is I think it's important to um, get Dr. Douglas um, and get him an assignment to be speaking to your group. I think it's important because he's carrying this torch of passion and 
it's different when you know you're you're getting information you're trying to assimilate it but if it's not your calling then i think you can mess it up i think that we need to get more voices in uh our presentations and uh, a part of our stages and that's one of the things that i really wanted to iterate i've had Dr. King to speak on our Freedom Classroom One platform, mm -hmm. and people were, all of these educators were like, oh my goodness, and it's, it's like they start changing in their classrooms because that passion and that agency came from a man that lives it. That primary source is very important. So I want you to be the next speaker for my Freedom Classroom 101. I will definitely get with uh, Dr. King. Thank you so much. Thank you for your kind words, uh, Mrs. Peebles, but this, this allows for us to kind of close it down. I just want to reiterate, I hope you guys are understanding, and I know that's why you're here, this unique space and this connection to Dr. Nathan Head that you see in Dr. King and what he's doing, not what he's saying. I do my best to come to the conference. I want to make sure that those things are important so that I meet people like everybody here today. So, Ms. Peebles, do you have my email address? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. So, it's also, again, for all of you all who teach K through 12, I would love to see how we could synchronize what we teach to have a greater understanding of making sure our youngest populations are having the opportunities to grapple with this in a formal setting and then create those informal settings where they become far more attuned to some of the more critical aspects and concepts. But I want to thank all of you all. I want to thank the, the whole group. And always for uh, Dr. King, like I appreciate him greatly. And I look forward to trying to uh, quickly submit my proposal for this year's conference. So yes, I, I hope to see some of you all there as well, if my proposal is accepted. That goes back to Dr. King. <laughs> All right, good people. Uh, excellent presentation. Okay. Let's give Dr. Dixon a hand again uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to come educate us and talk with us um, here. It was a pleasure to learn with you and from you. Um, there's a lot of links. Like in the, there's a lot of links in the chat. Um, I will uh, send out the email with the uh, chat transcript so you all can have those those links. Um, remember, um, conference presentations, proposals, if you're interested in presenting, go ahead and um, go to our website, drop your proposal off so we can um, have these wonderful ideas. If you're ready for Beyond February um, and the book club uh, today and starting about 25 minutes, make sure that you register for that and you should have the link uh, to that already. All right, if there's no other further ado, people, You'll have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next Saturday with Kirsten Duncan, with Sepp Nacart, and um, Black mm -hmm. Educators. All right? Hey, thank, thank you. you so much, sir. I had a right great on. time. Thank you. I appreciate you. All the time. I'll talk to you soon. Yes.